Hey everybody and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be and welcome to uh, another SolarWinds webcast for 2020. Uh, looking forward to having a conversation with today and discussing uh, IT operations management uh, and looking at that uh, from a number of contexts, especially in the, the current climate that we're in today. Um, first of all, we're going to kick off with a quick poll. Uh, we'll run that in the background. So. Um, the very simple one here, what's your role? So uh, you know, are you kind of senior leadership, uh, CIO, CXO level, uh, IT director, IT manager, administrator level, and so on. So you should see a poll popping up uh, any second, and uh, you can take your time to answer that. You've got a five minute limit, and uh, we'll, we'll continue on with the presentation. So first off, I'm gonna start off with some introductions. Uh, introduce myself, I'm John O'Callaghan. I look after product marketing for SolarWinds uh, in the international markets. I'm actually based out of uh, our Cork, Ireland office. Um, in the EMEA region, uh, but I look after the Asia Pacific uh, and uh, Japan region as well. Uh, being in IT, you can see from the hairstyle there, I've been in IT for many, many years. Uh, started way back uh, in 1988 in a company called uh, International Computers Limited, which at the time was the uh, UK's biggest uh, IT company. Uh, and uh, just coming to the end of the mainframe era for them. So I've seen the mainframe, seen the minis, seen distributed computing, gone through the virtualization piece. And of course, today uh, we're seeing lots of new technologies and trends hitting the marketplace as well. And of course, that just drives a lot of complexity into IT operations management as well, which is one of the big uh, conversations we're having with customers around the world. Um, delighted to be joined by uh, two of my esteemed colleagues, uh, Mr. Kevin, Sir Kevin Miele, I think he's known as. Um, so, Kevin, uh, good afternoon to you and welcome on board. Thank you. I definitely appreciate uh, y'all having me here today, and we appreciate everybody for joining us as well. Uh, my name is Kevin Mealy. I've been with uh, SolarWinds for well over 10 years now. Been in the IT industry for uh, over 20, actually. I was a um, on the customer side for quite a while uh, before I joined a company called Tech Tools, who's, who was then acquired by SolarWinds. So um, I am uh, currently working on the sales engineering team and. Uh, you know, one of those folks that's going to help you to uh, get through your evaluations and, and really, you know, do some uh, knowledge transfer. And you still have good hair for juice, you. So far, so good. <laughs> Another 10 years, all that will be gone, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also delighted to introduce uh, Michael Douglas's nephew, Nigel. <laughs> nice to meet you today. Not too bad. Uh, not a lot of people know that, so we kind of keep that quiet. But um, Nigel, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> compared to the two of you, I haven't been in the IT industry as long and certainly not in SolarWinds as long, but uh, I guess I'd be one of the newbies if you want to describe it that way. Um, I guess my background is similar to Kevin. I've worked a bit with the customers, uh, customer facing roles. I've worked in kind of a few different roles from data analytics to the support side. So uh, it's exciting now to be able to work with you guys today on this. Good stuff and thanks for joining. Um, so today we're going to go through um, a number of topics uh, and interlace that with uh, some demonstrations from Kevin and uh, Nigel as well. And I might do a little quick demo at the end if we've got time as well of the solo and service desk. But really we're looking at kind of um, the challenges that are facing organizations uh, in today's kind of uh, changing uh, economy. And of course, anybody who's been in IT as long as I have, or even as long as Kevin has, and even Nigel, we all know that the IT uh, the industry is always changing anyway. There's always new technologies to um, adapt to and to integ integrate to um, the solutions and so on. Um, but today, uh, with the uh, current uh, pandemic around the world, of course, we're seeing a lot of uh, new things being accelerated as well. So some of the conversations I've been having with customers uh, in the me and APJ, um, the feedback was that actually IT projects are getting accelerated because certainly in relation to things like work from home projects and so on, um, you know, by, by necessity, of course, um, you know, budgets and things were being approved much faster to get things get things done more quickly. Um, now, of course, uh, in our industry, in terms of um, monitoring, management, security, IT operations management, um, the more um, you know distributed things become, uh, the more challenging uh, that becomes in its own right. So, uh, our own market, we're seeing uh, extended challenges as well. So uh, our job as an organization, as, as, you, as we go through this, is really to kind of reduce complexity of IT operations management as much as is possible. Um, I'll never say, you know, we'll get down to a perfect one solution fits all, because that's uh, probably not uh, exactly telling you the truth. But we certainly want to get to the stage where you have uh, fewer tools to manage, uh, more integration, more interoperability, um, you know, 
people in your teams kind of looking at the same dashboards, to, uh, speaking the same language uh, in relation to the technologies and so on. So we'll have a look at that as we go through this uh, in the demos as well. Um, so and I, I'm, I'm going to show you in a couple of seconds the, the SolarWinds IT operations management um, framework. And we've, we've really wanted to simplify our message to our customers and prospects and partners around the world um, so that we can get a fairly clear understanding out to you guys in terms of you know, what, do, what do we do as a company uh, and what do we deliver in terms of the IT operations management piece itself. Okay, um, so some of the challenges we're seeing, uh, obviously we're seeing some shrinking budgets. Um, as I said, some budgets have been, um, uh, you know, I suppose sped up would be the word, um, accelerated uh, depending on the need. Um, and we're, you know, from a security perspective, of course, uh, we're continually looking at kind of new threats and unknown threats that are coming into that uh, space as well. But for me, the big one is in the middle there, the complexity of it. Um, and when you look at it, uh, end users, I suppose, if you ask an end user, do you think IT has become more complex or less complex over the last 10 years? The end user is probably going to say it's less complex, right? Because, you know, we can access applications from any device now, from any location, as long as we've got a good Wi-Fi connection, and off we go. Um, everybody in SolarWinds is working from home right now, and I'm sure in your own organizations, um, you're having the same situation. Um, but operationally, you know, we've continued uh, as per normal. And I suppose we're lucky in some respects that the technology has been made available to us to continue to do that, even when these type of global crises uh, hit us as well. So we kind of focus a lot on the complexity issue um, because even though the end user might find it a bit easier behind the scenes, as we all know, in terms of IT professionals and leadership and management, um, keeping that, uh, you know, those systems available and performing as required uh, is a never ending challenge. Um, and of course, as systems become more diverse uh, and more distributed, uh, that becomes more challenging as well. So as I said, you know, we've gone through the virtualization stage. We've seen the emergence of containerization, uh, which I suppose is the next level up from virtualization. Um, we've seen the software defined everything. We've seen converged technologies um, uh, and so on, right? So we're in this kind of ever-changing world uh, and we need to adapt as much as we can. So this is the um, IT operations management portfolio that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, so SolarWinds as an organization, you know, if you ask anybody at a trade show or at, a, at an event, you know, what, what are the things that come to mind when you hear SolarWinds? Um, some people say solar power and windmills, um, but we don't do we don't do sun things and we don't do uh, wind. Um, so, but most people from the IT industry will say, "Oh, you're the network management guys or the network monitoring guys," um, and that's not unusual because you know we've been in the industry for 20 years now, and uh, obviously a lot of our uh, products in the initial years were around uh, network monitoring. The two guys that founded the company were actually network administrators. Uh, and they had built some tools to help themselves in their daily tasks and decided that these might be a good thing that other people could use and decided to set up a company. Um, the name Solomons came from the fact that they were both astronomers and uh, they liked looking into the celestial skies for solar flares and all this kind of stuff. So Solowinds is the name of the company and of course we've got a platform called Orion which is another celestial term that came out of that. I think eventually marketing said enough of the uh, celestial themes in the company. Um, so, you know, again, when people say we're kind of network monitoring, we want to make sure that we clearly and easily kind of state, you know, what do we do as an organization? Um, so this framework makes that nice and simple. Uh, as you can see within the framework, there are six uh, pillars uh, within this. Uh, at the top there, you have service management, and we've deliberately not called it IT service management because although it does include the, the IT service requests that you will see coming through and so on, and uh, service catalogs, et cetera, um, you know, it, the service requests can really come from anywhere, right? It could be a HR request, it could be procurement, uh, it could be logistics, it could be anything. So we just wanted to simplify that down and say, we, we want to provide solutions that can manage all type of service requests that come in uh, and beyond that as well. The four orange bars then, the, the pillars there, application performance management, uh, of course is a very well-known industry term as well, APM. Uh, and in here, we want to look at how, how we can help organizations manage the kind of changing landscapes in applications as well. So again, you know, going back to the, you know, the mainframe days, everything was in the big box in the corner. And if the green lights were working, that was fine. There was no real monitoring required of it at the time. Um, but now, of course, you have applications that are very diverse. You have your packaged applications. You have uh, applications which are built in-house using traditional software development methodologies where there's a release you know, every 18 months or whatever. Um, you also have, of course, the SaaS applications that many organizations are moving to. And of course, you have the new custom apps, 
where you have DevOps teams and agile development and so on. So lots of different kind of mixtures of applications within companies today. And uh, we want to make sure we provide you with the uh, capability to monitor and manage and analyze all of those uh, within, that, within that pillar. Of course, many applications rely on databases. And of course, database industry has also seen quite a lot of change in the last number of years. Um, we were all familiar with Oracle and SQL and, and so on down to the years, DB2 and Sybase, which became SAP ASE, et cetera. But of course, now we're seeing the emergence of the kind of more open source NoSQL type databases, such as MongoDB, Redis, et cetera, Amazon Aurora, and so on. So we want to make sure, again, that we have solutions in place that allow you to monitor the performance of those databases, regardless of what type of databases it is. Um, applications plus database then, of course, will also rely on uh, underlying infrastructure. Look, that's where your servers, your physical servers, your virtual machines, uh, your storage array, storage networks, all of those elements, of course, are required to be available and perform as well. Uh, and of course, the one where we're not known for most of all, the kind of the glue that puts everything together uh, on the network management side, um, because without the networks, um, nothing can communicate, of course, and therefore uh, everything can fall apart uh, quite quickly if the network goes down. So all of those are kind of um, need to integrate together, need to interoperate, need to be available and performant to give the best business services available to your customers and uh, suppliers, et cetera. And then on the right hand side, you'll see the IT security pillar, which of course moves in a vertical sense because it really affects all of the layers of IT and technology um, uh, as well. So again, you know, the IT security industry is a kind of a complex one because it's extremely fragmented. There's over 450 different vendors of technology just within the IT security um, pillar alone. Um, so we've selected a number of those that we're kind of targeting uh, within that area. Um, in terms of our customer base, um, traditionally when we were kind of network monitoring and so on, we, we obviously typically talk to the administrator levels, so the network admin, the sysadmin, the DBAs, the storage admins, etc. Um, and we obviously continue to do that uh, every day um, right now. So if people have got issues they need to get fixed, um, you know, we can have a look at the framework, have a look at the pillars, have a look at the products within the pillars and identify what might fix that problem uh, quickly for you. Um, if you want to in start integrating products together into more of a platform approach, then you're kind of putting, uh, it's more kind of a management decision. You're getting into kind of IT director level conversations at this point. Um, and of course, if you want to take IT, IT operations management as a strategic approach within an organization, then it's looking at that entire framework at the CXO level, the CIO, CTO levels, et cetera. Um, and then of course on deployment and monitoring, we, de we monitor on-premise, we monitor cloud environments, and we can also deploy on-premise and in cloud as well. And you'll see in a little while we've got you know, SaaS offerings, we have licensed offerings which can be purchased either through perpetual or subscription um, and so on. So very flexible deployment options uh, there as well. So um, we kind of see applications as the, uh, I suppose let's call it the king of the hill in ITAM because these are the ones which if there's a failure or degradation, um, this is the one that's typically going to get escalated uh, most quickly. Um, it's certainly if there's a revenue stream attached to it or if there is a service stream attached to it um, and the application slows down or fails, then immediately going to have uh, escalations. Uh, senior management is going to get involved very quickly and of course uh, that will come back down the line to the service management teams and the network teams and the system teams, etc. Um, so really we want to make sure that the applications are running as, as, as best as possible and performing as best as possible and we want to make sure that all of the underlying elements that support those uh, are running as well and that we can alert and pre-alert on any potential issues uh, that may be occurring there. Okay, so some of the questions you might have uh, in terms of IT uh, operations management, you know, things like automation. Um, so if you look at your IT environment right now, and uh, if you look at kind of adding up all the different tools uh, that you may be using right now to monitor and manage your environment, um, that's an interesting question to go through. Uh, typically, if I'm at a trade show or an event and I meet a customer, one of the first questions is, you know, how many tools are you using today to manage uh, your environment? Um, and it's not untypical to hear, you know, 10, 15, 20 different tool sets. Um, the challenge there, of course, is interoperation. Uh, if they're not talking to each other uh, or they don't integrate, then of course that can cause more problems than the value that they may bring. So when we talk about complexity, one of the key things is consolidation of tools into uh, a platform uh, and into kind of connected uh, capabilities within uh, a framework of strategy for that. Uh, and that's what we're all about uh, as an organization. So 
good time to have a look at it. Um, so here's the demo. I'm going to hand control over to uh, Kevin initially. So bear with me one second while I do this. So Kevin, I'm going to make you presenter. And let's have a look at uh, some of that consolidation on the Orion platform. And then Kevin's going to hand over to um, uh, Nigel, who's going to bring us through some of the latest uh, SaaS technologies we have as well. Over to you, Kevin. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you, Nat. Uh, thank you, uh, John. I appreciate that. And um, basically, so with the Orion platform, uh, I know that uh, most of you are current customers of ours. Uh, you know that we have a number of different products that sit within the Orion framework. And uh, some of the, the key things that uh, really kind of go along with what John was saying is, you know, how we can visualize the entire environment, whether it be on premises or within the cloud. Uh, so being able to see the entire stack, right, from your applications to your databases, uh, you know, your virtualization layers, your, your storage layers, as well as those network uh, connections too. So this is just one example of um, you know, some of the, uh, the Orion map features that uh, you, know, you, you uh, may be utilizing already in your environment. If you're not, then uh, this is certainly a, a wonderful way to visualize um, you know, how things are performing. So within this environment, we've got a, you know, our Azure cloud, essentially. Uh, we've got a number of servers and applications running out here. We can see we've got IIS running out here. We've got SharePoint running out here. Uh, but we're also connected back through some SharePoint servers on-prem as well. Uh, so we can also uh, look at the on-premises uh, information. So this is where we've got, you know, even our, our core routers, we're looking at those connect connections between those. We can see we've got a Hyper-V environment even in connected in here. So um, really being able to see all the way through back down to, you know, our um, you know, things that are within our own data centers, but and also back out to where we have things in the public cloud. So it, it really, um, you know, helps you to visualize those. We've got a lot of statuses. We have a lot of application dependency information too. So you know, some of the things that you can do with the server and application monitor products, you can literally map out the different um, you know, connections by having an agent on all those Windows systems. And it's going to look at all those ports and processes that are talking to each other. And another example of that would be this, um, this exchange map here. So this is where we, we're actually mapping out the, um, the latency and packet loss between uh, you know, all these different pieces of the exchange environment where it is sitting on a virtual infrastructure. We're seeing that we have uh, pure storage uh, working within the environment as well. So I get a lot of questions around visualization. And this is the now that we've we've come out with these new features and, and really broaden our horizons with what we can provide within our mapping capabilities in the web console. Uh, this is one of my go to uh, places to be able to really show you as customers, um, you know, where you can you know really kind of get a better overall. Uh, visualization or view of your environment without having to click into a number of different things. I mean, you're just having the statuses of these icons and the and the the link uh, connectivity information uh, is is highly useful. And this is something you could put on a on a knock monitor where it's cycling through different slides. Um, so there's a lot of use here where if you do see a problem, you certainly can drill into those things. And this is just one way in which uh, you can visualize your, your data and, and, and really your environments to see what those statuses look like. Uh, another area or another example I could use would be you know maybe this IIS example. So kind of going back to what John was saying, being able to see you know the different layers of the applications uh, within just one place, right? Um, you know we're going to see within you know in the server and application monitor, which is what I'm looking at right now. I'm looking at this app insight for IIS feature that we have. This is where we're capturing a number of metrics from IIS, but we also have a little bit of integration over here with our app optics product, which is something that uh, Nigel's going to actually show you guys. Um, but this is where we actually have that, again, integration between our on-premises uh, tools as well as our SaaS products. So being able to pull some of these pool request information in for our web servers. And then if I scroll down a little bit more, you're going to notice that we've got database performance analyzer information in here. So database performance analyzer focuses on all those wait states within the, the SQL uh, databases, right? So now I can see all in one place how my web applications are uh, being affected as far as performance is concerned. I can see the database as the underlying infrastructure as well. If I scroll down some more, 
This is where the application dependency mapping information comes in. This is all in context of the web apps that are running within IIS. Right? Uh, so on the left-hand side, I have a lot of other information as well. And if I scroll down some more, I'm going to show you this app stack. So app stack, uh, if you guys aren't familiar with it, basically as you add products and monitoring within those products um, into, this, into the Orion platform, let's say server and application monitor, database performance analyzer, web performance monitor, um, you know, the virtualization manager product, as well as the storage resource monitor product. As you start adding those products in and you start monitoring the different aspects, we're going to automatically figure out essentially what those relationships look like. So when I need to get to a, a quicker mean times or resolution, I'm actually able to see the different layers within my app stack essentially, right, my infrastructure, to know where maybe I need to focus my efforts to fix a problem. Maybe it's not the application itself that's really having an issue. It might be that underlying infrastructure. And that's what this particular, uh, I'll call it the mini stack, uh, gives us the, the capability to do is we were able to literally see all those different layers of the app itself. Now, another area that we can also do some more visualization is our performance analysis view. So the perf stack. So this is actually through uh, the home screen. You go to per performance analysis, and then you can build these things out. This is a hybrid cloud front end example. So we have our IIS server looking at availability. We're looking at connections into our IIS environment. We have our uh, database instance that we're looking at as well. And then we're also seeing a, a number of other metrics coming off of our database performance analyzer where it's monitoring the database too. And if I scroll down some more, you're going to see additional information here. So things within Azure, right? So now we're actually looking at metrics that we're capturing from the systems that are running in Azure. So this is a way in which you can take the statistics that are important to you as they make sense within, let's say, an application's um, you know, framework right, all the different pieces of an application that really make up that application. We're going to able to put those statistics in one place, stack them all to see everything in a certain time frame. The reason I might want to do this is that if I'm trying to do some troubleshooting, I want to be able to see if there's any correlation between maybe uh, a particular change that maybe happened uh, in the environment, or maybe uh, I can see that, you know, I do have an underlying infrastructure issue where all of a sudden, you know, the performance has just peaked on maybe my underlying uh, virtual infrastructure, and that's causing application problems. So literally being able to see things in context of the app, um, you know, or any other, you know, uh, situation as far as how you want to kind of manipulate this, you could literally put um, uh, network information, virtualization, storage, everything can be in this place. And literally all it is is just dragging and dropping the uh, the details onto your screen. So, and I won't go through all the details here because in efforts to save time, but basically I could take SharePoint, look at a metric, and I can literally drag and drop it over here. And then what I do is I just save it as a project of mine. Everything comes in in the context of that time frame. I can change my time frames as well. And this really gives you that overall view of the things that you're going to want to be able to focus, on, focus in on that are important to you. Then you can take this stack and then literally present it back on one of the dashboards uh, so that way there you can keep an eye on it without having to even switch into this view. So um, that's really you know, how we're going to be able to bring all the different aspects of the infrastructure together from an application perspective right, uh, within the Orion platform. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to turn this over to Nigel uh, to be able to show you guys some of the ways in which we can also provide you uh, the capabilities around application performance monitoring through our SaaS products, as well as some of our logging and, and, and web performance monitoring uh, features as well. So just give me one second, and I'll go ahead and pass the ball over to Nigel. And as you're doing that, Kevin, of course, the, the Perf stack um, was a fantastic kind of value solution for organizations recently in terms of the pain they were suffering uh, in relation to not being able to see um, VPNs and that kind of stuff. So a lot of them created crisis dashboards um, using the Perf stack uh, solution as well, give them great visibility into uh, VPN tunnel usage and so on. Absolutely. Yes, it's, it's a great way to be able to see the network performance in, in such a way that really makes sense to you guys as customers. Absolutely. We should call it Tylenol. Tylen 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 is that it? <laughs> we call it Panadol over here for some reason. No. It takes all your pain away. 
<laughs> Perfect. So uh, if everyone can hear me fine, um, we're going to go. Squ uh, yeah, now we're going to look at App Optics. So it's broken into, like similar to other APM products, into two core functionalities. As Kevin was saying, there's definitely the, the infrastructure monitoring element that's essential to show you if we add a, an agent, in our case, the Snap agent, into an environment, whether it be a, a Windows environment or a Linux, Ubuntu, Red Hat, CentOS, Debian, you, you know, or even for distributed container inform, you know, if you're doing orchestration through Kubernetes, we can do that too. So there's the infrastructure element. And once you've added an agent, <clears throat> essentially a single service in the environment, we can plug into you know, your full stack sources, whether it be your web servers like IIS and Nginx, whether it be your databases like MySQL, MSQL Server, MongoDB, or other integrations. There's a bunch of community plugins that we work, in, work with or support, uh, and that allows us to get this uh, infrastructure, you know, visibility into the different applications that are in our environments. Going a step further, when we talk about full stack application, we can use App Optics to give us essentially transaction level or trace level insights into what's going on, you know, in that application, whether it be remote external calls, whether it be specifically down to the web server database, but also how those spans correlate within that full stack view. Instrumentation does this automatically for us within Reason. So, you know, similar to other APMs, what we need to do in this case is we instrument, we essentially make changes to or tamper with the language framework associated with that web application. So you could have a web application, more often than not, people build these in Java, but we support multiple language frameworks in this case. We'd support make have a, an agent for .NET Framework, .NET Core projects, Go, Java, Node.js, PHP, Python, Ruby, and Scala, as you can see on screen. Um, to do this, it's straightforward enough. We can, you know, for .NET Framework would be the, the easiest example. It would be proprietary to Windows. We would give it a name, so we can call it test1. And once we've given it the name, we're just running, not a really an agent, but just, you know, for the purpose of making the changes, it's called the .NET agent setup. So we run that executable, we authenticate the API token and the service name, which we just gave it being test1. How this is going to report back, that test1 is going to be the service name going forward. So we resize our IAS, or application pools, and we should start getting trace level data. How we do this, we, you know, in short, we're making changes to the libraries and drivers associated with the language framework. So when it makes a, a downstream HTTP web call, we'll collect these in the form of traces. This is really powerful because, you know, as John pointed out, the applications are becoming more and more complex. It's not a simple matter of, you know, this old, um, the monolithic style of just a client side, server side database. You know, you've got containerized hosts, you can have, you know, remote calls going to a bunch of different services. And also going into what Kevin was saying about the data visualization element, we certainly need to see the dependencies between these, not just the web service database and every other component involved in the application, but also these microservices, how they talk to one another. We could have a web server or sorry, a microservice like a booking service, and it might have the same database, you know, associated with a microservice that another microservice is using. So they're both using this Mongo database. Similarly, this booking service might be using more than one database associated with it. To be able to see in a holistic view where those bottoms, you know, this is just showing us where all the dependencies tie in. The next part we need to see is on a per trace level, per, you know, web call, we need to know what happened. Where was the slowest one in? You know, where were these anomalies coming from? So once we've identified the microservice of focus in this scenario, we can go back to our list view and we can see all the microservices we're currently instrumenting and collecting data from. It'll show us the associated host, the average response time or latency, the requests that we're seeing more or less traffic to the web application or web service, and then the error rate. Is there any exceptional data coming from it? We can go into any one of these services, and one thing you'll notice is AppOptics really makes APM or data analysis easy. You know, it's one thing just giving end users a metrics, giving them raw data and saying, visualize that. It gives you pre-configured dashboards. All of this comes out of the box once the data is collected. 
but it also has a type of proprietary algorithm or machine learning, if you want to call it that, to say, based on shift comparisons, based on historical analysis, we can say either we've seen an unusual activity associated with the host, it could be more or less remote calls going to another web service, but in this case, it's telling us, you know, on a very high level, it's spending most of its time making calls to a database. So if I didn't have that kind of analysis, sure enough, I could go into a details view, highlight over all of my activity, my remote calls, my application side, the database side transaction. And from that little blue icon, I can already see definitely the database is accounting for the most activity. But the fact that this overview page already tells me it's the database activity, I can just click on that button. It takes me to the database view to show me here are the tables that are most frequently used with the total time associated with those. So certainly this booking table is where I'm spending the most time, an average of 8.5 milliseconds per transaction. So already, you know, in a few clicks, since the data is all collected on a trace or transaction level insight, I can see what was the transaction. Here was the booking table. You know, it's filtered in all the conditions. So I can see from a top-down view, which is my slowest uh, trace, just the slowest activity coming from. The, so these are my bottlenecks. You can see it in a heat map, and the heat map, the idea behind this is the darker the color, the more activity in that time, the more transparent or translucent you see it, it, essentially less activity. But I could hover over, I could drag over this view to see those are my anomalies. Those are the two traces that are by far slower than the average activity. Or I could just, you know, from the top down view, filter to see here's my slowest activity. But if there's no errors, you know, if there's no active problems with it, I can go into my trace and I can see from the, you know, as Kevin was saying, full stack visibility. We instrumented in this case, with our web tier, there's a Ruby on Rails, you know, the rack framework was instrumented. I can see from start to finish in the total duration of that call, um, all of the components associated with it. There can be remote calls, there could be multiple web servers involved, there could be a database. I don't just want to see how much time was spent in those layers, but even down to the database, whether it's a SQL or no SQL DB, I want to even see what's the query is, you know, what was my slowest query. So this is true full stack visibility we're getting here. We could, of course, like we saw earlier with PerStack, take in individual metrics, you know, whether it be analysis from the database, from the web server and from the client side, but to be able to, you know, collect that true transaction level data from the application, Again, for your own custom, you know, highly distributed web applications, to be able to get this kind of summary view to tell you, here's how much time attributes to database. You know, in another example, it could be 60% of your time was spent in the code base, of which it gives you code profiling analysis, or it could tell you how much time was spent in remote calls, of which we can focus on what those remote calls are. You can even see there's a selected service call where the booking service was also called in, of which it's spending a large amount of time on that same database. So this is a very easy way to go from either down to our error or exception data and see what those errors were and better understand how we can troubleshoot those issues. Or if I looked at just a traced activity that's not an exception, but I could look at traced remote calls or traced cache calls, I can see what activity is associated with it. So it's very easy to find, you know, the needle in the haystack, I think is the aim we're trying to do in highly distributed environments. But how it kind of, we've made it easier is the integration with Logly, our other software as a service log aggregator, we can look at our trace requests, go to the slowest request. And if we have code profiling or not code profiling, but uh, the integration enabled between the two, I can simply click on one button to search logs and it will take my trace ID, the unique identifier associated with that trace request, and it will search through internal single sign-on that activity in Logly. And I should probably blow that up because that is definitely too small to look at, but it would highlight that specific trace ID and show you in an event timeline here at this moment in time, here are the matching events. But what's nice about Logly is it's definitely tailored for the same audience. You know, whether you're collecting log data from your web servers, your programming languages, and this is event data, you know, syslog, whether it be syslog ng or syslog uh, support for HTTPS, there's a bunch of methods to collect event data out of those distributed applications and look at event data alongside uh, application performance metrics. 
Um, perfect. I guess this is the point where I move it over to John. Actually, Nigel, if you want to pass the control back to um, um, Kevin there, there was a question popped up, um, which probably is a question that everybody might be asking. Uh, basically, the question was that they're actively working with our products in, 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 their, in their company. So thank you for that. We do appreciate it. Um, but they're trying to uh, track SaaS products like Zoom, for example. Um, so I, I sent the uh, attendee a link to one of our TWAC uh, pages, which we go through the process of monitoring Zoom. But Kevin, I know we could use NetPath potentially to look at that. So maybe you could do a quick view of um, NetPath to maybe help with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Let me go ahead and share out my screen here. And just let me know when you guys see that. So yeah. one running. of the examples, um, you know, as you guys were asking the question around being able to monitor Zoom, um, with NetPath, that's going to give us really hop-by-hop -hop response time analysis. So if you aren't already using this, um, I'll just take one of these uh, – hybrid examples really kind of show you how we can get out to, you know, through the provider into the actual, uh, you know, end uh, customer, you know, basically, you know, let's say the, the cloud system where you're actually um, trying to connect up to. So when we're talking about Zoom or what have you, and I'm actually going to use a different one here. This one, this one doesn't quite give me the example I was looking for for you guys. There's one way, which what we're going to do is you're going to put in an IP address. And then you're going to put in the port that you want to connect up to that endpoint with. So, you know, um, being able to test the connection to Zoom itself, uh, you could put in, you know, zoom.com uh, over port 80, or if you want to, uh, maybe there's another uh, endpoint that they allow you to test against, you could use this to do such a thing. So, you know, just as an example, getting into Microsoft, we don't have the Zoom on here, um, but basically what you would see is you would see all of the, the hops. Right, so uh, think of this as a trace route with a lot more capabilities. So we can actually do the multi pathing being able to see which direction all those packets are going to take to get to those different endpoints. So in essence, you could have a test happen where you're actually looking at that response time. This is just one way in which to be able to to see and visualize uh, that connectivity. Another way would be using the, the NetFlow uh, Traffic Analyzer. So if I'm looking at NetFlow Traffic Analyzer, I'm probably going to be looking at my top endpoints, right? Um, maybe my top domains. So if I go into, let's say, the NTA summary here, uh, with NetFlow, we're going to be able to tell you what's consuming the bandwidth, so all the top talkers. So if you're expecting Zoom to be one of those top talkers, then we're going to be able to show that to you. Right. Uh, so within here, you've got your top endpoints. So this is where you might see Zoom.com. Uh, you know, in this case, we're able to even see the uh, the applications, meaning you know maybe the World Wide Web traffic, which is exactly what that would be as far as Zoom is concerned. Uh, but then if I scroll down some more, uh, you'll be able to see even over here, right? The the top 10 applications are showing up uh, in a list, and we can actually see what those utilization what that utilization looks like, and what that HTTP traffic looks like, and where that's going through. So which what devices are these actually uh, traversing, and 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 what what are they actually um, you know, communicating with. So, you know, just be able to being able to use, you know, just the net path and, and this particular feature uh, with the NetFlow Traffic Analyzer will help you to understand what's really consuming all that bandwidth. And then zoom.com, uh, you know, you, you should be able to see that through the endpoints, right? You should also be able to see that through the conversation. So uh, who's doing the most video meetings even, right? So uh, with this, if I click into, let's say, I'll just click into the, uh, the WAN cube here. Right, when I get into one of the devices, then I can drill down a little bit more. I can look at my top five transmitters, my top five receivers. Again, getting into the um, the devices now that are actually seeing the traffic go back and forth. Um, the top protocols, again, the top receivers. So who's actually receiving the data the most through that uh, through that device? Um, you know, you've got your types of service and such as well. But this is really where we're going to be able to visualize a lot of that information. So the top conversations is really what I'd be looking at to understand who's consuming the most bandwidth with Zoom, right? Uh, so I can literally see between a certain IP, which would be the, probably the user, and the Zoom uh, domain, I'd be able to see that information here too. Right, uh, so you, it's a great way to be able to see it. Another good one, of course, you can now set alerts on NetFlow traffic as well. So 
if you set Zoom up as an expected traffic flow and it suddenly stops, it can indicate that um, access to Zoom has stopped for some reason. Exactly. Um, so you can kind of have a look at application down um, alerting as well using NTA. Yep, yep, that's exactly right. So you can literally set all those things up to, to be able to capture that information for yourselves. Cool. So if you want to make me presenter again there, Kevin, and we'll crack on. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so we've gone through kind of a very good example there, both from the Orion platform and from, uh, I suppose, the App Optics and Logly environments as well from a SaaS perspective, you know, how we address um, a lot of challenges uh, within uh, IT, right? So just jumping back one slide and asking these questions again, are you able to automatically monitor all layers of your stack to reduce time spent reacting to issues? Are you able to map the dependencies between layers? Are you able to automatically see logs and configuration changes? Do you have functional overlaps in your tools because of silos? And are you paying a premium for some monitoring tool and budgets have changed, et cetera? So all of these pain points that you might be suffering from, um, I think the demo has shown how the solo and solutions can help to really consolidate uh, all of these um, uh, solutions together um, to make it a lot easier for organizations to save time. And I know we have uh, a statistic that 29% uh, of IT teams' time is spent uh, uh, taking up uh, monitoring performance issues, and it's costing on average about $2.5 million per organization per annum. Now, obviously, bigger companies are going to suffer more in terms of cost. Uh, smaller companies will be a lot less, but that's the average number, which is uh, quite significant. Okay, so just moving uh, gears slightly into the uh, security domain. Um, so we can see here in terms of kind of threats that organizations uh, come from many, many directions. Um, you know, 70% proportion of data breaches caused by external attackers, which when you hear the word IT security, this is what you typically think about. You think of malware, um, you think of ransomware, you think of all of these attacker types that are out there trying to get your data and your money. Um, uh, but of course, uh, the, another challenge is kind of, um, system vulnerabilities, so kind of data breaches occurring due to poor patching. Um, that can be a problem. And of course, uh, you know, every, what was it, Microsoft's Patch, Patch Tuesday, isn't it? Um, where they kind of release all these updates and so on. People are familiar with uh, the regular patching that's required, uh, and that can be quite painful. So automating that type of process uh, can also simplify that for you. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we also have internal threats as well. Um, and, you know, they can be accidental issues where somebody shares a folder with, with sensitive information and people that don't have, um, uh, that shouldn't see that data do see it. And that would be down to kind of user permissions not being managed properly uh, and so on. Um, and other, other ones would be more deliberate. And we've, see, we've all seen stories on, on the news over the years of, you know, uh, critical data being taken from a company and used somewhere else, and then there's massive fines occurring and so on if they're caught, et cetera. So again, SolarWinds are kind of looking at these three areas um, primarily in relation to IT security. One is how can we help you identify uh, external attacks? Uh, how can we help you automate and manage patching? Uh, and how can we help you with things like uh, access rights management to ensure that uh, all, people only see the data they should be seeing within the company's um, data, data systems. Um, one question I do like to ask people, at, at, again, at events or meeting customers is, you know, are you 100% confident that your users can only see the data they should be seeing? And I can tell you the 100% of the answer is zero is not. Okay, so, um, you know, today's threats require a layered approach. So again, we talked about this in the framework that uh, you have your applications, your database, your infrastructure, your network, um, and of course, uh, security uh, is vertical against this because it's really looking at uh, security issues across of these, all, all these layers. So at the application level, you know, you've got things like secure coding challenges. Uh, in the data side of things, you've got uh, file integrity and encryption. Uh, and of course, some of the things there is kind of file monitoring for changes. So uh, FIM, as it's known in the, in the industry. Um, infrastructure primarily is going to be around the patching side of things. Uh, and of course, on the network, your firewalls, your DMZs, your VPNs, and in the database, of course, well, you've got SQL injections and that kind of stuff, which can cause challenges. So we need to look at this from, from a, um, an overall approach um, and see if we can uh, help in terms of integration across all of these layers as well. So um, these are the areas that we focus on, uh, patch management. Um, you know, if we can automate that as much as possible, that makes life a lot easier, takes away a bit of pain uh, from uh, administrators. Uh, threat detection and response, of course, uh, the more of these threats we can identify early and uh, eradicate uh, and stop happening, the better. 
Um, and of course, you know, application outages. I know we put applications at the top of the hill in terms of the ITAM, or IT operations management uh, framework. But I suppose uh, you know, an application down is one thing. Uh, an actual successful um, security breach is is probably even higher than that, right? Because uh, if somebody does breach your environments and robs data and email addresses and so on, that can have severe consequences. And I like to break down kind of impacts into three one, three layers. So you have operational impacts where you might have to move people around the place to fix a problem. Uh, that moves up into stage two, which is your financial impacts, where there's a cost associated to fixing something or you're losing a revenue stream or something. And then the third level, reputational impact, uh, which is the highest one where the company name appears in some Twitter feed or newscast because of uh, an incident that occurred. Um, I was down in South Africa a number of years ago now, and uh, we had a situation. We were doing a briefing for a customer there. It wasn't at Solomon's at the time, another company. Um, and the CIO uh, was called out of the meeting because um, there was a problem with the uh, local payment systems in, um, in, in supermarkets. And uh, when I went back to my hotel that evening, it was one of the first items on the news that people in Johannesburg couldn't transact. Uh, so that was a big one. Um, access rights management, this is kind of ensuring that people can only see the data they should be seeing, uh, that you can onboard and offboard people easily as required. If you've got contractors coming in or people leaving the company or joining, how, how can we have, make that easier? And then of course, configuration management. Again, you know, I think they say 80% of uh, outages and uh, issues occur because of uh, human error and configuration changes that are made, there's no backup, and it can cause uh, problems as well. So with that, we're going to go into another demo. So Kevin, I believe you're going to do a quick demo of um, ARM, Access Rights Manager. So I'm going to make you presenter again. So you have sure. control again there now? Absolutely. And yeah, I'm also going to show just a couple of other things as well, uh, sure. just really briefly in the security realm. Um, one thing I'm going to point out, um, you know, John was talking about account takeovers and breaches and such. Check out the uh, SolarWinds uh, Identity Monitor product. Uh, it is a SaaS-based solution. Uh, basically, it is uh, OEM through SpyCloud. But what it does is it helps with those account takeovers. It, it, it scours the dark web, and it actually will look at your domain names to see if there are any employees or usernames that are being used or that have been uh, exposed and their passwords where they've been exposed. So to be able to protect yourselves, uh, to know whether or not that information is actually out there and, and, and you know, really in people's hands that it shouldn't be in, um, check out you know, Sutherland's uh, Identity Monitor. And, you, know, you plug in your domain name, and then essentially it's going to literally scour the dark web for you, come back you know, within uh, you know, very not, not a long time at all. It's really just going to be uh, within uh, probably just a you know, few minutes uh, to first to initially give you the information. Then it will alert you any other time that the domain actually shows up in any other lists or what have you that exist out there. So this is one thing to look at when it comes to account takeovers. Preventing the accounts from being used in the first place is, is probably your number one first defense there. Then at that point, right, then we can get into, let's say, Access Rights Manager here. So Access Rights Manager is um, really, it's a, it's, it's a product that gets installed on a Windows system. It uses a Microsoft SQL database in the back end. The premise behind this product is to help you understand who has access, where they have access, how they have access. Right? And then from there, you get to determine whether or not people should have access. So really analyzing risk. This is mostly Microsoft focused. So we're going to scan Active Directory. We're going to stick scan Windows file servers and, and sys shares. So you know, the likes of NetApp and EMC, we can scan those things and tell you exactly who has permissions to the folders. And then we're going to allow you to remediate that through this product as well. We'll also allow you to manage user accounts and groups, streamline your, uh, your user creation process so that certain people don't end up in, in, in the wrong groups when someone accidentally does something. So we can prevent those accidental um, uh, group membership uh, you know, situations. And then from there, we can also provide you with reporting where maybe you want to have a framework uh, set up where you have non-compliant users. So set up a framework where users have to, have, have to be in certain groups. Uh, they have to meet certain criteria with their attributes. And if they're not compliant, then they're, they're going to show up in this non-compliant users section. Maybe you also want to analyze your environment to understand where you have passwords that don't expire. That's also a security risk. So you want to make sure you check those out. I know there's a lot of service accounts that exist out there that, that that's going to happen, but all those other accounts are, are things you're going to want to look at.
We're also analyzing for directories that have the direct access. So all these poor practices that have been put in place over the years where someone says, I need access to a folder, and then the administrator just says, okay, fine, let me go ahead and give you that access. They're not put into a group to give them the access. They're just directly defined on those folders. We're literally going to show that information for you and allow you to remediate that through the product. Right? We're also going to look at, let's say, those unresolved SIDs. So when someone leaves the company from a management perspective, right, you're going to delete their account typically. You delete their account without removing their permissions, the security identifiers are left. And now I've, I'm left with all these security identifiers and, and unknown users that have these access, and I have no idea what I'm looking at. Well, there's no real easy way to go identify all that and scan for that information. Access Rights Manager is going to help you with that as well. Um, from a security aspect, inactive accounts, right? I might have a number of accounts that have been logged into in, let's say, over 31 days. I'm probably going to want to see what those are, and I'm going to want to be able to remediate that. I'm going to want to be able to clean those up. So I'm actually going to click on this one so you guys can see what this looks like. So now I have a report that essentially I can act upon. So within here, I could say, all right, show me the distinguished name so I have a little bit more information about where that resides in my AD structure. But then if I see this and I say, oh, Frank, yeah, he's not here anymore, but he's an admin. Wow, let me go ahead and remove him. You know, he hasn't logged in in 400 days. It's been over a year since that account's been logged in. Right? These are things that we might want to clean up, and you probably do. So you're going to want to do these assessments on a periodic basis to be able to do this. Right? And I'm in the ARM web console. There's actually another console that I'll show you too. But basically, this is going to get you to the point where you can start to understand how the environment has been set up, where you have potential security risks as far as these, let's say, inactive accounts or accounts with never expiring passwords. And Access Rights Manager is going to allow you to fix these problems. There's an audit trail that exists with every single change that happens through this product, and it's called the logbook, okay? and I'll show you guys that too. But basically, that logbook is going to capture all those changes that are happening through our product and then allow you to report back on those come time when maybe you have an audit that happens. It's a very useful product. A couple other things I'll point out in the web console. There's a concept of recertification. Someone has access to a folder Right? Maybe we want to actually go and run a report to see everybody that has access to a folder. So I'm going to show you a PDF report that's been generated by Access Rights Manager. And what I'm looking at here is who has access to, let's say, uh, in this case, the archive folder. And I'm looking at the permissions, and I'm looking at those individual users that really should be in groups. Right? I told you we're going to identify these. And then I'm going to be able to see those groups, the users in the groups, and any groups within those groups with those users. I know it's a lot to kind of take in, but basically think about it this way. Our reporting is going to show you groups, users, nested groups, and any users in those groups. This is an efficient way of looking at your information. It's going to save you a lot of time. Okay. Now, if I were to send this to, let's say, the HR manager, he'd have to send it back to me. And then I'd have to say, okay, yep, you know, he, he marked it up and said, these people shouldn't have access anymore. So then I, as an administrator, I'm going to go and make those changes. Well, through the web console that I was just showing you, there is a concept called recertification, where this process can be automated. Okay? So literally, the HR manager can log in on a periodic basis. They're actually going to get an email from our system. And they're going to literally come in here and say, I'm going to start my recertification process. They're going to start to go through and accept and remove people's access, and then that's going to be scheduled to happen once they make all their decisions. This takes the, um, the basically all the administrative work off of the sysadmin, puts it on the HR manager or the manager that owns that data, and really it streamlines that process. So it does a really great job at that. Okay. Um, and I won't spend too much more time on ARM, but basically with Access Rights Manager, you get the web console that I just showed you. You have the reporting. That was one of the reports that I showed you earlier. Um, so being able to understand who has access to a certain folder. We can also look at where people have access. So where does a specific user or group have access? So let's say you had an account takeover and someone started to access your data. Well, I might need to know exactly where a certain person has access. Well, in this case, I'm going to say, I need to know where Emily had access. So show me all the places on my file server that Emily has access, 
and tell me what those permissions were so I know whether or not some changes may have been able to be made. And then from there, show me the additional audit information, meaning the group membership data. So I need to know what group she was in as well. Now, if we take this a step further and turn on the monitoring that Access Rights Manager can do for your file servers, then we have the ability to see who did what. So I could say, what did Emily do in the environment? What changes were made by that account? Because maybe it wasn't her, right? It was someone else using that account. Now I can literally traverse the file system from our logging. We call it our FS logger. That's an agent that gets installed on the Windows systems and actually watches everything happening uh, through memory, right? So you don't have to turn on Windows Auditing or anything like that. It just uses a filter driver. And we're capturing the reads, the writes, the creations, the deletions, the permissions changes. And this is a very, very useful report because then I can go back and track exactly what happened with that account. Right? And we're just literally just touching the tip of the iceberg with Access Rights Manager here. Uh, and I'll just point out one more thing, and I'll hand it back to John. This console that I'm showing you um, basically gives us the ability to look at all the resources that we've scanned. You'll notice that we can look at Active Directory, File Servers, Exchange, SharePoint, SharePoint Online, um, really Exchange Online as well, and on-premise. Uh, we also have the ability to scan Azure AD, OneDrive. So looking at all the different objects and permissions for these things and being able to remediate them, being able to make changes, group membership changes, permissions changes. Then I can visualize my group membership information from a parent-child relationship perspective. In this case, I'm looking at domain admins, and I can see all the users that exist there. The dashboard is one other thing I'll point out as well. This is our summary information about where, uh, maybe how many users and, uh, we have for administrators. So maybe, uh, what we want to see is how many uh, we have uh, globally accessible directories, so where everyone and authenticated users maybe have access. Right? It's a really, really useful product. It does a great job at telling you exactly where people have access, how they have that access. And then we're also tracking all those changes through here too. So this is the logbook where I can literally look at group membership changes, permissions changes, um, you know, group policy changes even, right? This is capturing things from the Windows Active Directory logs as well as those changes that are happening through this system. And this is just, you know, this is Access, Ma Access Rights Manager. Again, it does a great job at pulling this information and giving you the auditing capabilities. One other thing I'm going to show you guys is Security Event Manager as we're talking about security. Security Event Manager is our security information and event management product. We basically capture syslog data from your network devices. We're going to put agents on any of your endpoints, whether they be servers or workstations. We can look at failed logins. We can look at uh, you know, uh, denial of service type uh, events coming off your firewalls. Uh, this product does a great job at showing you where some of those attacks are coming from, as well as, you know, maybe I've got login failures where I've got a certain number of events that are happening and I want to alert on uh, correlated type events. This is going to do that for you, too. And I know that was a lot to take in, um, but I wanted to kind of show you the, the breadth of what we can do with our security products and, and just really a, a tip of the iceberg kind of short period of time, uh, high level situation. Um, and with that, John, I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to you. And uh, if anybody has any questions, by all means, put those in the chat for us. That's great. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, obviously, we tr if we try and cover everything at ITAM, we'll be here for about two weeks. So uh, we're running through this fairly quickly. So the very last piece will be done in a couple of minutes here, guys. Um, uh, we, we'll skip the demo on service. That's probably a good excuse for another webcast in the not too distant future. So when we talk around uh, service management, really it's a kind of a, a broad spectrum of capabilities. Um, so we're looking at things like service catalogs and really centralizing every type of request that you can imagine into uh, a single solution for your, for your organization. So some of the challenges you see in terms of service management is um, you know, some organizations may not have a service management um, solution in place and they might be managing things kind of in silos and different departments. Um, uh, you may have multiple service uh, management uh, tools in place uh, and so on. So really to kind of streamline that and to simplify it, we really look at kind of consolidating as much as we possibly can within uh, our service desk solution as well. So you, as you can see here, you've got service and catalog management, incident management, uh, problem management, change management, release management, and CMDB management as well. It's also got uh, things like inventory control and inventory and asset management built into it uh, also. It's a very powerful solution there as well. 
Um, so basically, you know, it, the idea of kind of um, you know monitoring uh, integration, so revol resolving incidents faster, and I suppose getting back to the base points here, what are we trying to do with service management? Really, is uh, two things. One is uh, response time uh, management, and the other one is resolution. Right. So when somebody has an issue and they want to get it fixed, the first thing that they're going to you know worry about is how fast am I, am I going to get a response to my question or my request. Uh, and then the second one, and probably a bigger one, is how fast is it going to take to get resolved? Um, so if we can help organizations to um, streamline that and uh, uh, reduce their response times and their SLAs for resolution, uh, that's a really powerful thing to do as well. As you can see, we do have integration as well in Service Desk uh, into our Orion platform. Uh, I was going to show you a quick demo of that, but I think we're out of time, to be honest. Um, but we can now send alerts from the Orion platform into Service Desk. We can get the incident number back out of Service Desk into Orion. And so we've got two integration there. And we can also send uh, Orion uh, asset information into the SolarWinds Discovery tool uh, for the asset inventory control uh, within Service Desk solution as well. Okay, so with that, um, I know we want to do a quick poll uh, to wrap things up. So if we can run that there. So would you like a personalized demo or other information on solving any of the following challenges? So what these ones are all kind of um, relating back to the six pillars of ITAM. Um, you know, simplify and streamline your service management, gain deeper visibility into application management, performance and availability, uh, identify database performance bottlenecks, uh, optimize monitoring and management of key IT infrastructure, standardizing your network management and reducing the cost of IT security. Um, so just to wrap things up and summarize, um, you know, organizations can typically work with us in three different ways. Uh, the first one is fix a problem. You've got a problem, you need it fixed quickly. Um, you know, within our product portfolio, within the pillars, within the ITOM framework, there's a solution that we can provide to you um, and we can, we can do that. The second level up is what I call platforming. So the idea we can take multiples of our products, integrate them into a platform, um, consolidate your uh, tools environment, your products that you use for monitoring and management, make it easier and better for you guys to uh, resolve issues uh, faster. And then the third one is really taking a strategic approach to IT operations management and looking at everything uh, as, a, as a strategy for management and monitoring of IT within your organization. Um, so we have those offerings. And then one other piece I'll just wrap up with is the uh, you know, what do you get as a SolarWinds customer outside of all the products and so on, and the platforms and the capabilities, et cetera? Um, well, we have the SolarWinds Success Program, which is a really powerful thing as well. Um, starting in the top right there, the SolarWinds Success Center, um, sorry, the, the SolarWinds Customer Portal, I'm going to kick off it. So if you become a SolarWinds customer, you get your own customized portal, and in there you can see all the licenses and products that you have. Uh, you get updates there. You get any new release information there. Um, you can log tickets from there. You can access technical information, etc. So you have that nice, simple, easy to use, intuitive web interface as well. Uh, from there, you can access the SolarWinds Success Center, which has got over 20,000 documents and video clips to help you get things done more quickly. We also have SolarWinds Smart Start, uh, which is uh, a number of hours that you can purchase to help you get up and running quickly. So we like organizations and customers to get value out of our products very quickly. So SolarWinds Smart Start can help you do that. Um, the SolarWinds Academy is uh, one of our is well is our training uh, continuous education program, um, and that is running uh, programs every day, every week uh, for training purposes. You can also um, cover the SolarWinds Certified Professional Program in that as well. TWAC, you don't need to be a customer to be on TWAC, but very, very useful to get on there. Lots of great information. Um, and you can also kind of uh, ask questions, get feedback. You can provide feature requests uh, if you wish. Um, and of course, you have your solo and support as well with professional support, premier support, and enterprise support um, levels available to you. And then for many partners around the world, we also have a partner portal for them to be able to access information they need to um, you know, talk to you about the, the products, the solutions, the value we can bring as an organization. So with the mantras, you know, uh, easy to use, scalable and affordable, absolutely. You know, we want to continue with that as an organization, um, get value quickly out of our products, be able to start small and grow big. Um, connected and modular approach. So again, you know, do you have a problem you need fixed? Uh, get it done with you know, a single solution, connect lots of things together and provide you with that platform. Uh, cover the full stack visibility of hybrid IT, so not just on-premise, but cloud, SaaS, uh, et cetera. Um, and then the comprehensive I ITAM portfolio, which we've kind of briefly looked at today, just to give you that capability uh, of coverage, right? Um, so final uh, Q&A, uh, if there's any questions in the chat, we can have a quick look at that there.
I know Jennifer has been keeping an eye on that. Any any questions there, Jennifer, you've got for us? Jennifer is all quiet. It looks like, no, no, we've covered the, the questions that we've had. Um, so with that, listen, I know we're out of time, slightly over the hour. Uh, apologies for um, going slightly over. Um, with that, it just leaves me to say thank you um, to my colleagues, Kevin and Nigel. Thank you guys for jumping on and helping us out today with those fantastic demos. And for myself, uh, thank you all very much for your time. Um, and to everybody who joined, uh, we really do appreciate your time. I know you're very busy uh, with your schedules, so we do appreciate it. Keep, uh, keep your eyes and ears open for future um, SolarWinds webcasts. We have lots planned uh, throughout the summertime, and uh, we look forward to uh, meeting you again at some stage in the not too distant future. So with that, um, we, by the way, this session has been recorded. You'll get a link to the recording in due course. Um, so we'll stop the recording at this point, and we shall talk to you very, very soon. Take care and goodbye.